penetration to knowledge. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته You are listening to the medical program brought to you by the Islamic Medical Association of South Africa I'm your host Fadila Rabitza Tomorrow on the 3rd of March we will be celebrating World Yarding Day the first thing we think of when we have a headache is to take some painkillers. When we have a cough, we think of using cough mixture or perhaps going to the doctor. But what do we do when we have difficulty hearing? Joining us tonight is Nabila Nala, who will tell us more about hearing loss and how it is managed. Nabila is qualified. Nabila is a qualified speech language um, pathologist and audiologist. She qualified with her honors degree at the University of Witt Bathurst in 2019. She currently works at the hospital in Johannesburg and has a special interest in the pediatric population. Assalamu alaikum, Nabila, and Jazakallah for joining us. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you so much, Fadila, for the warm introduction and thank you for having me on your program this evening. Thank you for joining us. So, Nabila, can you tell us a little bit more about what World Yarding Day is? Okay, sure. So World Hearing Day is celebrated each year on the 3rd of March, which is tomorrow. Um, the idea is to raise awareness on how to prevent deafness and to encourage hear, hearing care and ear care around the world. So every year, the World Health Organization, which is the WHO, decides on a pertinent topic and theme. The theme for to this year, which is 2022, is to hear for life, listen with care. So what the WHO is focusing on is the importance of safe listening as a way of maintaining and preserving good hearing to last a lifetime. The main idea is to decrease the high rate of hearing impairment and deafness within in the, in the world. That's a very interesting theme. Many people aren't aware that we can actually listen in an unsafe manner. So it's important to get information about this. And we tend to take our hearing for granted. Can you tell us what is the importance of hearing? There's so many important factors of why hearing is important. And often we as humans, we don't even realize it. We actually take for granted our hearing. Um, it is one of our senses. Um, and hearing connects us and allows us the opportunity and ability to communicate with our friends, family, um, all the time. There's a saying that um, that has stuck with me uh, from when I was a student. It's one by one of the famous activists and educators, Helen Keller. And she said, blindness cuts us off from things, but deafness often cuts us off from people. So I think our ability to, you know, communicate with others verbally is almost entirely dependent on being able to hear and listen to speech and the process um, and process the speech into passages. There's a direct link between our hearing abilities and our speech development. I often, you know, tell my patients that the way we learn to talk is by being exposed to being spoken to from birth. Furthermore, I think, you know, hearing is so important for our own safety and just being able to hear when you're driving a police car or an ambulance on the road instantly alerts us that, you know, there's an emergency or move aside. And also something simple as, you know, mommies and daddies will say, being able to hear our little ones crying allows us to be alerted that they are in need of help, they're in danger, or they even just awake. Um, it's often that these sounds that we take for, for granted. And I think going back to the saying of Helen Keller, hearing allows us to be integrated into society from, you know, from a small child, from going to school uh, in Madrasa to enjoying gatherings, whether it be at Eid, family functions, and then going to work, um, going to the masjid, all that needs your hearing. It also, yeah, so that's basically, it's also allowing us to have this conversation tonight. That's very true. So not being able to hear really, really does isolate us. 
Um, what you mentioned about the safety aspect of being able to, yeah, that actually reminds me of a patient I once knew. She had an audiology appointment and um, she had a ears tested. It was found that she had a hearing loss. She had to come back in to receive a hearing aid. I know we'll speak more about hearing aids later on, but it's a device that helps us to hear. Um, she actually missed the appointment, came in a few days later, and when the audiologist asked why she had missed the appointment, she said that on that day or a few days before, she was walking in the street and she looked left and right, there were no cars, and then she decided to cross the road and didn't hear that there was actually another car that was a bit further, and she got bumped. So she was actually in hospital um, on the date of her appointment. So safety in hearing is a big thing, and I think it is really something that we take for granted. No, definitely, and that is true. So there are two terms that we usually hear, deaf and hearing impaired. Is this the same thing? What does it mean? Okay, so I think to understand the term hearing impaired, we have to understand what actually is a hearing loss and what that entails it itself. So I'm just gonna go back to a little bit of basic anatomy, um, just to explain the process of what a hearing impairment and hearing loss is. So basically your ear is divided into three parts, the outer, middle, and inner ear. The outer part is the part you and I can see when we look in the mirror and and it goes into the ear canal. The middle part is where your eardrum and the ossicles lay. The ossicles are the three tiniest bones in the human body. And then the third part, which is the inner ear, is made up of the cochlea, the organ of hearing, which is, to explain it in the easiest way, looks like the shell of a snail twisted. And um, the inner ear also has the semicircular canals, which is basically your helps in balance as well as the nerves. So what, how the process works is that your outer ear basically cuts all the sound and sends it to the eardrum, which then sends it through to the ossicles and then to the cochlea, and then goes to the brain for it to be interpreted. A person who is hearing impaired has one or more of these three parts affected or damaged, and thus that causes the sound not traveling adequately through the system. The, the affected part of the ear can be, you know, a temporary loss and or permanent loss, resulting in a hearing loss. So to to go back to the more correct term we use is here for, for a person who has hearing loss is being hearing impaired. However, there are people, persons who you, with usually, you know, severe to profound hearing losses who consider and identify themselves with the deaf community and they use the capital D and call themselves deaf. And in most cases, these, these persons use sign language as their main form of communication. Okay, so you mentioned that um, a hearing loss is caused by damage of a certain part of the hearing pathway. How does it become damaged though? Are people born with this damage? So in other words, are people born with a hearing loss? Okay. So the answer to this is yes and no. Hearing loss can either be congenital or... So congenital means that the hearing loss is present at the time of birth. This can be to, due to a number of factors, which I'll quickly run through, due to genetic factors in the womb at the time of giving birth. Some include, you know, mom having German measles while pregnant, prematurity. So prematurity would be where the, the body, uh, the the hearing system has not completely developed, as well as genetic considerations. An acquired hearing loss, however, happens after birth. And this is usually due to you know illness or disease or injury. So I'm gonna run through a list of some of acquired hearing losses. So ear infections that are ear recurrent. For example, children with Down syndrome, they have uh, their ear sh canal shaped is different and puts them more at risk of middle ear infection. Meningitis is also another risk factor. Autotoxic medication. So autotoxic medication is medication that is toxic to the body, to the ear and the nerve supply of the ear. So medication, these med some of the tuberculosis medications and cancer medications cause autotoxic. 
head injury through like, for example, a motor car accident or abuse, noise exposure. This can be through, you know, listening to high volumes of the radio or television for long periods of time or attending concerts, as well as if you work in a loud, um, like a factory where there's loud machinery and equipment that also puts you at risk for noise, expo noise exposure hearing loss. Then there's something called barotrauma. Um, this is caused by the differences in pressures of your outer ear and your inner ear. And then also something that's so common that we see in babies is neonatal jaundice. And why, why neonatal jaundice is a risk factor for hearing loss is because the high levels of bilirubin actually affect the auditory system. Uh, and lastly, another risk would be presbycusis. This is the hearing loss that persons who are older, like your grandparents, your great grandparents, they acquire that hearing loss as they get older. So yeah, that's basically a bit of the types of hear the differences between a congenital and a acquired hearing loss. So presbycusis is the age-related one. I'm assuming that that one just goes with as you age, you start losing certain things and your hearing is one of those things. Am I correct in saying that? Yes, that's um, like just as you know, as one gets older, their eyesight perhaps gets weaker, their body, they're not as fast, they can't walk as well. So likewise, the hearing system also deteriorates as you get older. So yes, you are correct. Okay. So a permanent hearing loss would then be caused by damage to the organ of hearing, but a temporary hearing loss is usually caused by blockages. For example, if you have an ear infection and once that ear infection is gone, um, if there's no other damage, your hearing should return to normal. Another one that I know of is wax. And I know that wax is a big taboo subject, in fact. Can you tell us more about ear wax? We know that everything in the body serves the purpose does wax serve a purpose? I know that the, just the mention of ear wax, people are running to the ear, earbuds trying to get rid of the wax. So what is the purpose of wax? And also, how can we safely clean our ears? You have me laughing here and you are so right. Um, you know, we do run at the mention of wax or when, at the look when we see wax, we're like, ah, oh, wax. But you're right. Um, everything has a purpose in our bodies and so does ear wax. Earwax actually serves as a protection of, of the ear and the eardrum. It, it acts as a lubrication and it, the wax itself carries antibacterial properties, which, allow, which prevents the dry and itchy ears. It also helps to prevent and trap dust and water and other germs and foreign objects. So foreign objects could be like insects that can sneak into your ear while you're sleeping. Um, so the earwax actually helps that, prevents that from getting into your ear and irritating that very sensitive skin in the ear. So yes, having earwax is very normal and actually quite healthy to have. I think that's a very important one and a good thing that you cleared up for us. So just to reiterate, earwax is good. Am I right? Yes, it is definitely. However, you know, you... Mm -hmm. If you feel like you need to get rid of that dry, visible wax, I would say use a soft, damp cloth around your finger and gently, very gently, just wipe at the entrance of your ear canal. But please, 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 no earbuds. Earbuds actually do more harm than good. So what actually earbuds do, they push that wax deeper into the ear canal. And the prolonged use of this ear these earbuds build the wax up and actually you may present as having a hearing loss. And so, yeah, if you feel that you have accessible amounts of wax, please visit your audiologist to have a look and they can safely remove, uh, remove it. And also please refrain from, you know, making these homemade remedies and potions and then putting it in your ears because that definitely harbors bacteria and causes infection. Does the warm oil that people sometimes throw into the ears, is that included in the homemade remedies? Yes, yes. So you don't definitely, if you're putting anything in your ear, it should not be heated up um, because literally that creates a bleeding ground for infection. 
and it does. It's included there. So please, no homemade remedies, heated up oils. That should be what, made. Yeah. What about cotton wool? I often see people walking in the street, perhaps if it is quite windy, they'll have cotton wool in their ears. Is that recommended? Okay. So, no. Um, generally, you don't want to do that because also it, it creates a very warm environment um, in your ear and your ear is a natural cleaning organ, organ, so you don't need to be closing it or opening it up. Um, if you feel those issues in the cold and that, um, then definitely speak to your audiologist so they can do a test and see maybe there's an issue with your pressures in your ears or, or to further investigate. Okay, Nabila, so you've given us quite an earful already. We're going to go for a short break. And when we come back, Nabila is going to tell us more about the symptoms of hearing loss, things to look out for, as well as how to manage a hearing loss. It takes hard work to make your dreams a reality. Not with Motala's, where building your dream home, renovating and maintaining it is a breeze. Motala's, your one-stop building and hardware suppliers. Motala's timber and hardware for all your hardware and plumbing supplies. Motala's brick and timber city for all your building requirements. And Motala's trust plant, your roof specialists. Free quotation, advice and delivery. Motala's one-stop building supplies situated on Main Lawley Road, Anchorville. Telephone 857-1213. New from Mercedes-Benz. Introducing expert tyre fitment. Because the best cars deserve only the best. Shiraz Auto now offers expert tyre services, including tyre sales, fitment, balancing and alignment, and tyre insurance for your complete peace of mind. To find out more about fitting the best tyres for your Mercedes-Benz, contact Shiraz Auto today on 011-213-1100. Mercedes-Benz, the best for nothing. Violence and looting has raged in South Africa, resulting in fears of food and fuel shortages. While politicians and experts are still trying to figure out who's on the wrong or who's on the right, the saddening reality is that many innocent people are already bearing the brunt and they need our help. Donate to Crescent of Hope and help distribute food to the needy in these difficult times. Contact Crescent of Hope on 011 854 1809 or file 137 Rose Avenue, Indonesia. Visit Crescent of hope.co.za Crescent of Hope, serving humanity for the pleasure of Allah. <laughs> Planting a tree is one of the best ways of giving back to a community. You did not only give them shade of beauty, you gave them a source of life. Let us preserve nature's reserve. Radio Islam International. The medical program on Radio Islam, your station to knowledge. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the medical program. If you have just joined us, our topic for this evening is hearing tests and hearing aids. Our guest is Nabila Nala, who has been telling us about the importance of hearing and some factors that can put us at risk of hearing loss. She's also been telling us about how to safely clean our ears. Right now, we are getting back into the symptoms of hearing loss. Interestingly enough, 9 out of 10 children with a hearing loss are born to parents who are hearing. Nabila, can you tell us more about the symptoms we can look out for in babies specifically that could indicate a hearing loss? Okay, thank you, Fadila. So, um, with regards to babies, it's definitely more tricky to pick up signs and what to look for. So I'm just going to, some of the, the symptoms we look for is that baby doesn't react to loud sounds. For example, when you bang the door, they don't, you know, startle. If you make a loud sound or say on the left side of the baby and they're not turning towards the left or they're not reacting, that's also something that we look at. Um, when as the baby gets a little bigger, so a few months, they start, we, we, usually see them vocalizing, which is those baby sounds, the oohs and the ahs. If they're not doing that, that's also a risk factor. And also, if, you, if you're speaking to them, you're holding your baby and baby's not, you know, engaging, looking at you, smiling, that's also something. And also a main factor is if your child or baby is born with a malformed ear or doesn't have an ear, that's putting them 
at a high risk of having a hearing loss. What about in toddlers and school age children? Because here we have some speech. Okay, so the main thing we look for as a symptom in this age group would definitely be delayed milestones in speech and language development. Also, we, when they are watching their TV or listening to the radio or playing on their iPad, they want to have that volume at high levels. Also, you, these kiddies show you know, learning difficulties or poor performance in school, or the teacher's always saying, you know, this a, a, a little one is just not listening, he's naughty in class, he's having behavioral issues. Also, if they're not paying attention to you when you're speaking to them, so you're calling their name, you're saying, come, yeah, they just don't, like they almost not listening or hearing you. And also when you call their name, they just don't respond. Um, also, they have trouble hearing in noisy environments. So those are not everything, but quite a few of the symptoms we do see in that age group. But the main one would definitely be the delay in speech and language. I think an important one you mentioned there is also children um, presenting as naughty. Because of course, if you aren't able to hear, you can't respond, you get frustrated because you aren't hearing what someone is telling you to do. And it's very important for parents and caregivers to look into that, like what is the reason behind the child being naughty? Is it in certain instances, specifically when it comes to giving instructions or is it over or to distinguish whether it's actually naughtiness or if it is a hearing loss? Um, you also mentioned that a delay in speech is one of the symptoms, but we often hear things like boys are slower or perhaps sometimes parents or caregivers aren't concerned about a speech being delayed because another family member may be had slower speech, only started speaking at the age of five or something like that. And we are often told to just wait it out, the child will catch up. What are your thoughts on this? So, you know, to be honest, I think this is one of the biggest misconceptions and generalizations in our society and the fact that we wait it out because that's actually, in fact, detrimental to the development of your child and the learning of your child. And often parents think that the child will be, be fine, you know, in school and not realizing that, you know, the most important years of development is actually before school. And it's through the playing and the interacting with the siblings, with the mom and dad, that's so important. And number two, when we think that they'll be fine in school, we fail to recognize that in South Africa, our classrooms are overburdened. There's often more than 30 children in a class and inevitably, you know, they get lost through the cracks um, and they slip by and they just become children who are unruly or who have behavioral issues and they just don't, the issues don't get picked up or if they do, too late. So no, um, please don't wait for your child to get to school. If you feel, if I've mentioned any of these symptoms and they seem similar to what your child may be experiencing, please take them for the help they need. What about the symptoms in adults? What should we look out for? Okay, so adults, it's a bit usually easier. Um, so as an adult, you're, if you feel that, you know, the speech, when someone's speaking to you, it seems muffled or distorted. So what that means is basically like, you know, if your head is underwater, it sounds like you can't really hear what's really going on. Um, another one is you have difficulty understanding when someone is speaking to you, their words or their sentences, especially in a noisy environment. And you are constantly asking them, you know, please repeat that for me. Huh? Huh? What are you saying? Um, that's, that's a big factor. And then also, if you are listening to the radio or television way too loudly, um, and often it's the husband or the wife telling the other, you know, that's way too loud, I can hear it from the kitchen. And then also, if you find that you're not, you know, participating with your friends in a conversation as you usually would, then that's something also that could be a symptom of a possible hearing loss. But I think it's important to mention also, you know, these symptoms are not a one size fit fits all. So it may be that you may experience all of these symptoms or none at all, or just one or two. So it has to be to the to each individual.
So now that we know what to look out for, who do we go to if we do suspect a hearing loss? Okay, so you would definitely start at your, you can start at your local clinic um, or your, your doctor or GP if that may, if that is something you are able to. So you go to them, you tell them your concerns or if it's for your child, they, the concerns that you're raising, they are able to write a referral letter um, to your closest audiologist at a clinic or if you choose to go privately at the audiologist that's closest to you. And then you would book an appointment and visit the audiologist and then they will do the hearing tests that are necessary to diagnose a hearing loss. And that's basically the process that you would follow. Nabila, can you tell us more about these tests that the audiologists do to diagnose hearing loss? Um, is it painful and also is it the same for adults and children? Okay. So, no, it's not painful. Hearing tests are definitely not painful. I think there's a, that misconception that they are intimidating, but definitely not painful. So, for you to be have a diagnosis of, a, of hearing loss, an audiologist will go through a few tests and then what they do is that they collate that results to make a diagnosis. So the tests done for adult children as opposed to adults do differ. Um, something that's important for both adults or children is the case history. So having a case, this allows the, the audiologist to get all the information regarding family history of hearing loss, disease and illness, you know, the development of the child, birth and pregnancy of mom, it's in, in an adult, they ask questions such as the work you do, your educational information, and all this plays a part in the test that we decide to carry out. The whole idea of a hearing test is basically to find out the softest sound levels that can be heard by a person in each ear. The results are plotted on a graph, which is called an audiogram, and a person is considered to have a hearing loss if they are not able to hear as well as someone with normal hearing levels. So hearing loss also varies in degree and it can become, it goes from mild to profound and it can either affect one ear or both ears. So going back to your question on the tests, tests uh, on how to find this information. So an adult who is of normal functioning, for example, we will give a test that requires a response. So an example would be we place this adult in a soundproof room and then we put on earphones for them. And then we place certain sounds at different pitch and frequencies and we ask them to press the button or to you know, raise their hand when they hear the sound. For children, um, depending on their age and their ability to respond, we may also use a similar test where we put them in a soundproof room, but then instead of, um, you know, letting them press a button, we may use something that's more stimulating. For example, drop this toy every time you hear the sound. For babies and infants, we tend to use tests that are objective. So they don't usually obviously just require a response from baby, but baby has to be asleep and the environment has to be quite quiet. So objective tests, you stimulate the different parts of the ear and elicit a feedback. So that's basically how we test um, children as opposed to adults. But about people who are definitely abled, you mentioned the tests for adults and older children where they are required to do something, but a child with cerebral palsy, for example, who isn't able to talk much and has limited mobility, how would you assess their hearing? Would you still use the same tests? Okay. Um, so we are able to test both adults and children who are disabled. Um, so we may be able to make use, it depends on their, you know, their abilities to communicate and respond. So we may be able to use some of these response needed testing. Otherwise, we do use subjective testing. And this, um, otherwise we use subject, uh, object, sorry, I'm getting confused there, objective testing, as this doesn't need a response, but rather the patient needs to be very quiet or asleep. If after a few tries, we, you know, we, we're not getting any results from the subject of testing or the environment is too noisy for the objective test that we have in our offices, then we may, rec uh, we may require more specialized tests. An example of this is a sedation APR. So this test needs to be done in theater while the patient is sedated. Um, and yeah, 
So they basically asleep and this test runs and we get yielding levels through that. But obviously this is not the first port of call. We always, you know, look at all factors and then in, if it, if it need be, then we go back there. It's good to know that hearing tests are accessible to everyone. Once the hearing has been assessed, what happens then? People used to think that if you have a hearing loss, your only option is to use sign language. But now we know that there are devices that can help to hear, such as hearing aids. Can you tell us more about what hearing aids are and are there any other options available? Okay, so a hearing aid is usually is actually a small little device that can be worn in or on the ear that basically amplifies and makes sounds louder. It's basically just like how glasses help you to see clearer. Hearing aids allow us to hear better. Um, there are many, many different types of hearing aids available in on the market that the audiologists make, but it is very dependent the hearing aid that is fitted is very dependent on the type and severity of the hearing loss. So I'm going to run through a few types of hearing aids and hearing devices that are used. So you get hearing aids that are worn behind the ear. And how that works is that there's a tube that runs to the front and into the ear canal. Then you get hearing aids that are hidden and they are called in the ear canal. They Adults tend to prefer this one because they are hidden and you don't see them. Um, as, but re, it's important to remember that the type of hearing aid depends on the severity of the hearing loss. Um, and also normal hearing aid, the ones that I've just mentioned, are not painful or not invasive. They don't need any operations. Then you also get um, hearing a bone anchored hearing device. This type of device is used to amplify sound but it needs an operation to be done because basically it's placed on the mastoid bone of the behind the ear. And this type of hearing device bypasses that outer and middle ear and sends the signal straight to the cochlea. This type of hearing device is used for people who don't have, you know, they have those malformed ears or they don't have ears. And also for those uh, patients who have those recurrent ear infections. So the, it's called the bone anchored hearing device and that's what you would use for them. Another one that's quite common and we hear of is a cochlear implant. It is a device that needs to be surgically implanted. And it, what a cochlear implant does, it directly stimulates the cochlea and, the, and we know that the outcomes for having a cochlear implant for hearing are very good. But the downside is that it is super expensive so the criteria for getting a cochlear implant is very strict and also the aftercare is also much more than just a general hearing aid. So it seems like there's a range of different devices available to help us to hear better and they are both non-surgical and surgical. Um, can you tell us about the health professionals or professionals in general that are involved in the diagnosis and management of hearing loss? Okay. So some of the members of the team, it's what, it's an MDT team, so it's multidisciplinary, and the audiologist. So the audiologist will be the one doing the assessing, the diagnosis, and the fitting of a hearing device. And they also carry out the how to care for your hearing aid. Also, after hearing aid is fitted, um, there's something called oral rehabilitation. Oral rehab is basically the training of how to use the hearing aid and how to best incorporate that into your daily life and to improve the quality of your life and how it, how the brain will, you know, uh, get used to the signals of the hearing aid. Then you have the speech therapist. A speech therapist helps persons with hearing loss to find effective means of communication as well as for that language relay for them for understanding. Then we also have the ENT. The ENT is part of the team and helps in treating conditions of the ear. For example, they may prescribe the medication for that recurrent middle ear infection. They are also an important part of the cochlear implant and insertion team. Another important member is the teacher, um, especially if you have a child with hearing loss. So, so just diverting a little, there's also schools that cater for children who have hearing loss. And these schools usually have on-site audiologists and speech therapists. 
And um, those children, the classes are either, you know, they verbal um, or in spoken, verbal in spoken, or they can be where they use sign language. Um, so yeah, the teacher is very important in, and they are basically the middle person between the teacher, the mom, the parent, and the audiologist to, to let us know, you know, is it working? Are we winning? And then also there's a psychologist who is also a team player for person with hearing loss. I think it's also important to note that there is a difference between a special needs school and a school that caters to children who are hearing impaired. Since a special needs school will have a lot more therapists and it, it, it usually caters for children who have comorbid, comorbidities, not just hearing loss. And as you mentioned earlier, that hearing loss has, it can vary in degree. So certain kids will actually be able to cope in a mainstream school as well. Yes, definitely. Especially if they, you know, they've been fitted earlier, um, as soon as they found, like in the early years of living, they have the ability to, you know, in, be incorporated within the mainstream setting, definitely. I can imagine that finding out that you or your child has a hearing loss can be quite devastating. What support is available for patients and their fa families? There's also still a lot of stigma surrounding hearing and so many people don't want to raise him. Can you tell us more about this? Okay, so yes, um, you know, something that's often said is that when we can't see well, we go and get glasses and then we get the branded ones, we get designer glasses, but and we pay thousands of rands for it. But when we, but when an ability which is so important to us, hearing, is is we have a hearing loss, our mindset change, changes. Hearing aids have become, you know, a connotation of if you, you're old, then you have a hearing aid. Or and it's quite difficult to shake that that mindset. So hearing loss is definitely shrouded in that shame and that self consciousness, and it often leads to untreated hearing loss and a fact is only one in five people who should be hearing having a hearing aid actually have one because of the stigma that's attached to it and a way of overcoming that's you know that stigma i think it's it's identifying that yes it is completely normal to grieve the loss of your hearing and feel anxious about wearing hearing aids and not being able to you know do what you previously did but wearing your aids is the first step in overcoming that stigma. And also the second step would definitely be explaining and making those around you aware of your child's hearing loss or the or your hearing loss. So education is key. Mm, definitely. So as you mentioned earlier, we are celebrating World Hearing Day tomorrow on the 3rd of March. And the theme for this year is safe listening. The Prophet said there are two blessings which many people lose, health and free time. Bearing this hadith and, this, and the theme of safe listening in mind, how can we take better care of our hearing? So that's very true. Our bodies are sacred and, and each part has a purpose and needs to be looked after. So some of the ways you can take better care of your hearing is to be conscious of your body and mind and what you what information you take in and what you do to it. So in ways of preserving your hearing is keep the volume down. Check with a friend or family member if something seems too loud or too soft. If if you work with loud equipment and machinery, make use of you know protective equipment such as earplugs or noise cancelling headphones. Also, we live in an age of technology. So use it beneficially, I would say. There are apps to monitor hearing levels as well as if you are, if I, you know, mentioned any of the risk factors and you seem to be under that, get your hear, hearing regularly checked up. Also, limit your time that you spend in noisy settings. Before we end our show, is there any message you'd like to leave with us? Okay, so definitely don't take your hearing for granted. If you or someone you know may be at risk or may have a hearing loss, visit your local clinic or doctor and they can refer you as soon as possible. Remember that we have been given, you know, these amazing qualities and that we have the responsibility to look after them. So get your ears tested and also don't use earplugs. 
earbuds. <laughs> Very important, don't use earbuds. Jazakallah so much, Nabila, for joining us on our show. And Jazakallah to our listeners for tuning in. Jazakallah so much for having me this evening. Discover the African.